All right, my friends. Now, when we're talking about the world of coaching and personal training and uh, athletic performance, this guy who is my guest today, you, you drop his name and anyone who follows the right people in the fitness industry knows his name. And uh, I've been a, a fan and following and actually had him as my coach for a while um, just because he is so impactful and knowledgeable and just on top of it. And so today's guest is the one, the only Mike Robertson who owns Robertson training systems is the founder of iFast in Indianapolis. Um, and I mean, his resume is like 10 feet long and, uh, <clears throat> he's just so good and ethical. And now we could have done gone down the rabbit hole and talked training, um, forever a day. You know, he wrote my, my training programs. He was my online training coach because I wasn't obviously going to Indianapolis, but he wrote them for a year. And then I attended so many of his just different seminars and stuff like that. And he's been one of the founding reasons I train and coach people the way that I do. Um, and then uh, took some of his, you know, first certifications and, and stuff. And, uh, and he's been in the industry for nearly 20 years and, and just such a wealth of knowledge and still putting out so much great stuff. So instead of going down the rabbit hole with talking about training and different things like that, because he's got his own amazing podcast, the physical preparation podcast, where you can find all that. If, if more than likely, if you're wanting to go down that, you're either really into fitness, form, technique, or you're a coach yourself. Um, so I encourage you to do that. It's one of my favorites. But I, I kind of wanted to just share the other aspects of what allows him, uh, as he shares at the age 41, with kids and multiple businesses uh, to keep going. You know, what keeps him encouraged and inspired, but also what gives him motivation and drive and how he's able to maintain his own health and regulate um, so that he doesn't burn out. And I think there's really valuable things for all of us to pick up on and how to deal with stress and, and how he's doing so. So it's much more of a get to know um, the one and only the amazing Mike Robertson, but also how to pick up on some things that have worked for one of the most successful people in the game. And if it's worked for him with juggling all of those things, I think there's something to it. And there's so much that you're going to be able to learn from this. So I will stop rambling and uh, we'll get straight into it uh, with Coach Mike Robertson. All right, Mike Robertson, welcome to the show, my friend. Dude, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, you've been an influence to me for... 10 years uh, that, that I've been, you know, slowly getting into the industry 10 years ago and then seven years when I officially decided. Um, but man, you've been, you've been cranking like info and just stuff in this industry for what? Like, like 20 years, man. 20 yeah. years. Yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned that because I don't know, something about this week, uh, I, I don't go home very often, but like my home's like 45 minutes from here. So like went and saw my old place, was going through like old training gear, like the original RTS gear you know as i was cleaning out my closet so yeah man it's it's made me a little nostalgic but yeah i'm closing in on 20 years dude it makes me feel kind of old but also makes me hopefully think that uh, i've made a positive impact on some people along the way yeah no and that's what we were even talking about before the the show is the ripple effect that you've definitely had um and i think like the main reason is is consistency like when i when i think of like people who are super consistent it's not that you just put a bunch of stuff out and then disappear and a bunch of stuff out. You know, you were writing blogs consistently and then now it's podcasts and, you know, uh, Instagram, yeah, like you've, yeah. yeah, you've adapted and stuff. Um, but I think that's why 20 years of consistency. So definitely give us some insight on, on that. Like how do you yeah. build a set of consistency? Cause I think everything, yes, you're, you're mostly training some really incredible athletes these days and, and doing sure. some awesome stuff and other coaches, but there's still almost all of this applies to every single one of us. So Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I tell every young person that emails me. I mean, I still get DMs and PMs and emails. How do I, how do I get, you know, up in the industry? It's like, man, first off, you've got to be super authentic to who you are, right? Like don't try and be somebody else. Uh, I actually had John Berardi on my podcast earlier this week and we just went back and forth. It's like, could you imagine if Eric Cressy tried to be somebody else? Oh man. John Berardi tried to be somebody else. Like, no, like just do you. So be authentic. And then yeah, consistency is the name of the game. I've seen so many people that have great things to share. Um, you know, just, they, they fizzle out. They'll, they'll either do too much too soon or they'll get burnt out. They'll, 
I always tell people do something, but now it's like every day, right? In the Instagram world, I used to tell people when you're starting a blog, expect to write a blog for 52 weeks, one year and expect that maybe your significant other and your mom is going to read it and be okay with that. And if you're okay with that, then eventually if it's good enough and you're authentic and people resonate with you, then they're going to find you and they're going to start to follow you. But now it's, it's shouting, you know, it's shouting in a crowded room. So you've got to find ways again to be authentic, but that consistency, if people are seeing you every single day or they're getting your message every single day, that's what you need to be really successful. And if you don't do that, it's going to be really tough because there's so many other people out there that are willing to do that and are willing to be consistent and put out that content every day to make sure that they're in front of people and getting their message across. Yeah, no, definitely. What do you feel like keeps you kind of motivated with, with all of that? Yeah. So <laughs> that's a great question. And it's something I think about a lot. Um, I definitely think for me, there's a, a sense of higher purpose to some degree in the fact that, I mean, I feel like committed, it's weird to this, to our industry, right? I feel like for a long time now, I've wanted to make our industry better. I feel like I've got something powerful or positive to say. Um, and I know firsthand, like, it's just not puppies and balloons <laughs> all the time. And, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I'm very positive. I'm very optimistic. Even in the worst case scenario, I'm going to be optimistic about things. But, man, I'm also a realist, and I've done it 20 years, and I know that, you know, Sometimes things aren't going to go the way that you want and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to fail. And we used to look negatively upon that, especially myself. I'm a perfectionist at heart, bordering on OCD <laughs> with uh, training and programming and all this stuff. But, you know, it, early on in my career, I looked at failure or mistakes as like something personal, like I suck, like I'm a bad human. And over time, I started to realize, no, like the failures, the mistakes, those are the things that help me learn. Those are the things that help make me what I'm maybe not a great coach, but help make me a better coach along the way. And so those things are powerful now. And to kind of unleash that, that's really powerful. So to, to come back to your question, the reason I do this is because I feel compelled to move our industry forward. I feel compelled to help young coaches, young trainers. And sometimes it's the X's and O's. It's how to coach an exercise. It's how to write a better program. And sometimes it's just, hey, look, like you're going to have bad days. You're going to have days you want to quit. You're going to have days you feel like you suck. Like that's normal. That's okay. I still feel like that <laughs> 20 years in, you know, I take yeah. losses still to this day and it sucks. But, you know, you dust yourself off, you get back in the game and you move on with life. So that's why I do it, man. I just feel compelled to, to help our industry, to move our industry forward and to help people. That's what yeah. I'm in it for. No, and I, I appreciate that, um, you know, because from a standpoint of, you know, uh, for the last years telling you I've been online, you know, with, uh, you know, getting having the other gym closed down, uh, selling that to, to a good friend and then now shifting to, to opening a new one. And I really kind of wrestled with now that I'm having, you know, this opportunity to have a louder voice online and to speak and to do all these different things. And, you know, my intent was one podcast a week, uh, kind of yeah. going to your blog, you know, yeah. thing, and, and here we are closing in on 41 and I That's should awesome. be close to the 52 by the end yeah. of the good for you, man, the year. So that same concept. But what is interesting I found is like ego was kind of coming up. And, and that wasn't around before, you know, in, yeah. in the gym, in the trenches, just working with like, you know, amazing humans, you have that connection and you're able to take your failures and, and whatnot with them because you're going to have a slip of the tongue and say something that you shouldn't have said. Yeah. And it's hot right sure. there in the moment. And now it's like, man, this, this is a new thing. It's like ego of, did people see my stuff? Is it going out? Like, yes. And, and I started wrestling and with that. And that's why I wanted that, that question more for just myself of, yeah. you know, it's like, man, like it's so easy to fall trap into, into that. Cause you're not getting that instant feedback. You can hide your flaws more in this online world. And I think that's one of the dilemmas. Absolutely. So this is something I talk to people about all the time, whether it's training, coaching life, it doesn't matter. It's so hard now because we're constantly subjected to via our phone or our iPad or our laptop, everybody else's highlight reel 24 seven, right? And it's curated and it's cleaned up and it's, you know, like pretty, well, look, man, but that's not how life is. And that's what I try and come back to people, like, especially the young coaches at our gym or the young coaches that I interact with, 
you know, they're hungry. They want to be great, but they feel like in some way at 22, they're behind. I'm like, but no, you're so far ahead. <laughs> you have no clue, right? Like a good coach at our gym or a good coach that invests in high quality products. Now you could be better in like two years, just from a pure X to the nose perspective than I was until I was 15 years into my career because there's so much great information out there now. Now you're not going to have the experience, yeah. right? You don't always know why it works, but still from a purely X's and O's perspective, you write a better program. You're going to coach exercises more effectively because the information is there. So I'm a hundred percent with you. Like social media is such a blessing and a curse. Yeah. And I talk about it a lot. If you use it in the right way, if you use it in doses, if you follow the right people, it can be a massively powerful tool. But I've got a gauge, you know, and it's generally about two to three minutes. I start looking at social and I start feeling bad about myself or feeling like I'm not doing enough of something and it's done. Shut it off. Right? I love because, that. Because that's, social, that's not what social media is for. Now, maybe that's what they make it for. You know, I don't know. They've got those brain hackers and people that are trying to figure out algorithms and all that, whatever. I use it in, in a way that, you know, I want to follow the people that I like. I want to see what's going on in their lives. And I want to, again, I use it as a tool to contribute. Yeah. No. Use it as another way to connect with people. Yep. And I think your, your content speaks volumes to that, you know, for sure. Thank so, you. so Thank I appreciate you. that. You know, it's interesting because you talked about like having such an optimistic mindset and you're typically an optimistic person, but yep. then you've also mentioned, you know, two of the main things that, uh, you know, people, people tend to say like, Oh, I sabotage myself. I, I tend to think it's like self-preserving, right? It's preserving yeah. the identity that we had. And you mentioned perfectionism in comparison and, yes. and those are definitely two of the roots. Um, yep. So how have you shifted or what methods do you use or, or what has been your kind of tools or guidelines to remind yourself that those things are just ways to kind of keep you there and mm -hmm. this optimistic mindset? Like, how did you kind of develop that? So I don't even know if I have a real question in that, yeah, but I no, no. contrast. I, no, I know what I you know, mean. Man, even just our regular gen pop that goes in and trains in a gym and they see someone else deadlifting more or, you know, has lost more weight. So I think it's just something we all deal with and I'd love for you to speak on it. Absolutely. So, you know, I think for me, and, and I've talked about it and alluded to it a, a handful of times in my show, but like just a lot of the things that I did early in my life were not very sustainable. You know, I enjoy, I love to live life at the edges, right? So if I'm going to work hard in school, I'm going to live hard on the weekends. <laughs> um, and, you know, I did that basically into like my thirties, like we opened the gym and it's not like it was every weekend, but it's like, Oh, I'm going to go out and you know, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out hard, you know? And, and so again, a lot of that was rooted in self-esteem, self-worth issues, not really knowing my place. Um, and I think one of the big things for me, I'm not saying you should go out and, and have a kid, but having a kid made a big impact on me and having my daughter really helped me realize like, look, like, what am I doing? You know, like I'm holding myself to this ridiculous standard this person only cares that I treat her the right way, that I'm a good father to her. Um, so that really started things. And then just kind of shifting, just like the shifting my perspective and my mindset of how I should be as a human being, right? Like I started mm -hmm. to realize like, look, nobody's perfect. These people that I look up to, like they're not perfect. They make mistakes. They have strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I think part of it too was just having a, a broader life view you know, I don't want to wax philosophical here with you, but like <laughs> when I was young, it was all about training and coaching in my career, right? Like laser focus. So when that's the only way to judge yourself, well, that's fine, but it's, it's kind of narrow in focus. Yeah. And so as I started to widen that worldview and realize like, look, man, I want to be known as a good human being. Yeah. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father to my kids. Now, it's like, is my career important? Yes. But I have found some semblance of balance, right? And then, okay, well, being perfect at work isn't like the single most important thing in life, right? I'm, I know I'm never going to be perfect as a human. So it's like, why am I holding myself to that, that standard when I'm at work? So I think for me, it was like just finding that broader worldview, realizing, and absolutely, we have the best job in the world. Yeah. I say that all the time. We have the best job in the world. We can make an impact a positive impact on people every single day. But that doesn't mean we have to be perfect. 
And so I basically whittled it down to the saying that I use a lot. And it's like, take your work and take your career seriously. And what I mean by that is educate yourself, strive to be a better coach, strive to be a better trainer, make a connection with your people every single day, but don't take yourself seriously. Yeah. And so once I started to have that mindset, it was like, okay, now I'm just happier, healthier. And I found balance in a lot of areas, right? Like now it's not powerlifting to see, can I PR every single time I'm in the gym? It's like, Hey, can I take great care of my body? Can I feel young and athletic as long as possible? I fuel myself the right way. I get enough sleep, uh, you know, meditate pretty much every day. I'd love to say every <laughs> single day, but pretty much every day. So it's like broader worldview, more balance in my life has led to just a healthier relationship with a lot of other areas in my life. Yeah, no, that's so cool. And you actually touched on a few pieces that I definitely already had kind of questions mentally lined up for you. Perfect. Um, but, but I love like almost the Mark Fisher approach uh, of, you know, serious training, ridiculous humans, right? It's like, yeah. you know, take, take the craft of whatever it is you're working on seriously and put genuine effort into it, find your balance with it, but then have fun with it is really Absolutely. the message. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I always tell our coaches, like, I want you to be great. I want you to be a great coach, whether, you know, especially when you're here, you know, and as you move on, if you move on out of here, that's great as well. I want you to be a great coach, but make sure you enjoy it. Yeah. Like the last thing I want is for somebody to show up and for work to feel like work. It yeah. should feel fun most of the time. And if not, you got to question why that is. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the most powerful things that I picked up a number of years ago, and I don't even remember who it was from, but, but identifying the have to's and the get to's and when you need to shift. My you gosh, know? Yes. So often it's like, ah, I have to go coach. And then I'm like, wait, what? No, I, I get to actually make an impact. And just that right. simple language catch and shift, it does it, numbers. Huge impact. And what I found a lot of times too is if I use that language with things that I would normally not enjoy doing now it's like way more tolerable right yeah. i don't know why that is but it's like i'm dreading whatever doing my quickbooks now i get to do my quickbooks i get to run my own business i get to set my own rules like that's a totally different shift or a totally different mindset but it makes such an impact on how you approach things in your life so i love that too i use it quite a bit yeah no i definitely definitely think it helps and it's like it's this weird thing of abundance that humans seem to wrestle with right and, and yeah. it's like i was i was helping a, a friend of mine who's just starting his business up and <clears throat> we got some leads going for him um and, awesome. and and you know he was really nervous about it at first and he's like i'm not gonna have enough you know leads coming in to make enough sales and to make enough money Yep. And uh, so we got that happening and now he's like, I have too many leads and I'm really stressed <laughs> out and I, I need to like pull this back. And I'm like, right. you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't do leads or ads guy, right? I just gave him some tips on how to connect with humans. Like, yes. you know, um, and, <laughs> and, and so it was like, man, like it's the don't bite the hand that feeds you type thing. Uh, and, and, and I see it so often with clients too. And I'm trying to prep people more than anything else of like, <clears throat> it's this like, man, I, there's food everywhere and it's really hard to resist. And then come Thanksgiving time, there's too much food. And like, yeah, it's like right. this abundance thing, you know, and, yeah. and I think it plays out in the gym and you, you probably see it too. First world problems, man. Yeah. That's what I always come back to. It's like, oh my gosh. And I remember Alan Cosgrove back in the day, people would ask him cause he was doing all the, the business seminars and people would ask, Oh, what happens? what happens when you get too many leads? And you know, Alan, I mean, he's got yeah. like his Scottish accent. He's like, right. wait, so you're worried about having too many people in your gym. And then it's like, everybody laughs and you're like, okay, yeah, really? Like, let's find something to be like really worried about, you know, like not being able to make payroll or something like that. It's way more worrisome than having too many people coming in. Totally. <laughs> so funny. So uh, you mentioned, you mentioned meditation. And, yes. uh, I definitely want to touch on that. Like what got you even into meditation, um, and, uh, where you at with it now and what's been your, your findings, uh, dude, I could probably do a whole show with you just on this. Cause this has been quite a journey. Um, yeah. I have tried, tried air quotes to meditate. I would say off and on for seven, eight, nine years. Right. And I've tried all kinds of different things. Um, I had read books. There was this program called Holosync way back in the day that like Jay Ferrugia had put me on to. I tried that for a while. I tried Headspace. 
yeah. off and on for like a year, year and a half, wasn't super consistent. And then I don't know what it was, but I think one of my, my distance clients who comes into the gym, into the gym, her name's Sandy. She was like super consistent with it. I'm like, man, I feel like this is making a positive impact for her. So her and I basically buddied up and I just said, I'm going to do this every day. She, and she made the comment like, look, you know, like you don't have to do 10 minutes. Like you can literally do one minute meditations. I was like, look, if I can't do a one minute meditation. Like I've got bigger <laughs> problems in life. So I said, I'm going to do it. And so literally every day for a year. And there were days like literally 1158 or whatever at night. I'm, I'm like, oh man, I need to get to bed. I was like, oh, I'm going to do the one minute meditation, right? Just clear my head. And so that really got me started on the path that made it a consistent routine. And you and I both know if you're not doing it for like three months, basically every day, yeah, it, it's really hard to get, make it a routine, right? Cause whatever, 15 days, it's not going to cut it. They're saying whatever, 60 to 90 days to make something consistent. Yeah. And so then it's even it, the, the frequency of with which you do it within that, that matters and absolutely yeah, so many variables, but yeah, it's still important. Ab absolutely. So I said, I'm going to do it every day. Uh, so I had a buddy that helped. So I had accountability and I just set like a notification on my phone for like the first three months. And it was like, whatever I was doing it at night at that point in time, but the time is less important than getting it in. So I started there. And then this past summer, one of the athletes that I was working with, Glenn Robinson, he'd done headspace for a while as well. And he came back, he'd gone to Chicago for a couple of days and he was like, Oh, I did this really cool thing I think you'd be interested in. It's called Transcendental Meditation. Okay, well, tell me more about that. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, you got to do like this four-day like intense training and all this. I'm like, okay. So I start digging in and it, it feels a little cultish at the start. I don't know if you know anything about it, but it is. It's like a four-day intense where you go 90 minutes each day for coaching. Nice. So, and the goal of TM is to do it twice, 20 minutes a day now. What, well, again, this is why the, yeah. the, the air quotes of try to do it every day, right? But that's kind of where I'm at now because, you know, I look at meditation as the fourth pillar. So there's training, nutrition, sleeper recovery, and then meditation. Like those are my four. And I just feel like when I do this, when I am consistent with my meditation practice, everything about my life is easier, right? And, and I have my schedule jammed just like yours. Right. There's stuff going all day. I could stay busy all day, but I've just said, look, I'm going to focus more on the quality of the work and being clear in my intentions. So now I know when I do that, I'm clear in my intentions. I'm working on high priority tasks. When I'm spending time with my kids or with my wife, I'm all in, I'm focused and it's going to sound super hokey, but I felt like after I started doing this, I really felt like when I'm, I'm not just looking at my kid, but I'm seeing my kid, if that makes sense, you know, like, and, and again, I realize that could sound hokey or a little bit over the top, but I'm, I'm a dad too. So that's yeah, just, you're that's just like more powerful. <laughs> yeah. You're just, you're just more clear, um, in everything that you do. So it's been a huge thing for me. Um, and I struggled a lot with anxiety, depression, that sort of thing when I was younger. Um, so it's really helped tamp down a lot of those things. And, you know, we talked about just finding that balance in life. I think meditation for me was a major player in that. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, Cause I can definitely relate on, on a lot of aspects. You know, I was, you know, initially introduced and told uh, how powerful it, it was. Um, I think it was Steve Krebs who actually first, oh, yeah. first introduced uh, Deuce it to me. Cause he's like, you know, talking about how he was struggling with some anxiety and I was at the time and I was uh, at the time, I think I was just in the process of hiring my first coach at the gym. And it was like, that just triggered a bunch of <laughs> new levels of anxiety. If I'm going to yes. be responsible for payroll for somebody's like life, you know? Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And, and then it was like, you know, so I tried and then stopped and then tried and then stopped. And I think it was maybe seven, eight times before yeah. I gained consistency. Um, but I'm curious because even now, like even this morning, right? You know, it's like, I know it'll help me. I know I'll get more clear. I know that I'll be more focused when I'm jumping on this podcast with Mike and yep. set me up for success for my day. And it's the, I know, and then I have to literally shift to the, I do before I can get to a yes. place of like being with it. Yeah. Um, and it still feels, you know, forced. And I'd say I'd only missed two days out of this entire year thus far. That's awesome. That's um, awesome. But do you feel like it still has to be something you 
deliberately are like, nope, you got to do this, Mike. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and part of it too is switching from the headspace, which is, you know, generally I do like a five to 10 minute meditation going to like 20. That's yeah. a big jump. Um, so definitely there is some newness there, but it's something that I think number one, it's got to be a priority. You have to constantly come back to the benefits behind it. It's like training or nutrition, right? Sure. Like we know we should work out. We know we should eat this, whatever, beautiful uh, grilled salmon and veggies versus the triple Whopper or whatever. Like we know we should do that, right? So then it becomes down to like reaffirming, like how is this going to benefit me? And making, and then, and then it becomes, okay, now it's just managing or owning your day. And so that's where just like you plan your workout or you plan your work day, right? Hopefully you plan your work day, <laughs> but you do that and then you plan your meditation. So like for me, I know what I have to do this day, including our podcast and the work that I have to get done. And I know I'm going to meditate sometime around lunchtime before we do our staff training because I want to be rejuvenated. I want to be focused. We've got a young team at our gym now. So I want to make sure that I'm fresh and I'm ready to go when we do that staff training day. So it's like anything else, like you remind yourself of the benefits and then you have to take action. You have to plan it and make it a part of your day. And I think as coaches, that's something we all struggle with, right? Like we're so good at taking care of other people. Like, yeah, man, why Joe, you missed this work. Why did you miss your workout? Or Joe, why did you, why did you have five martinis at dinner last night? <laughs> you know, like we're so good with other people and keeping them accountable, but we're the worst at keeping ourselves accountable. Yeah. So you just have to like own it and you have to put it on your calendar just like it's an appointment. It's just an appointment for you versus for somebody else. Yeah, no, that definitely, definitely makes sense. I love that kind of plan um, and building it in because then you're just building it into your identity of who you yeah. are. Um, and so spot on with, yeah, caretakers <laughs> burning <laughs> out, right? Like, yes. Um, I used to laugh because I, I literally would have uh, certain certain sessions where, you know, we would have 10 12 people coming in for more of like a lifting type type class yep. and it would be physical therapist, physical therapist, nurse, teacher, physical therapist. Like, <laughs> I was like, yeah. I have more, more PTs and nurses than like, right. Like, than actual gen pop clients. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. That's funny. Uh, um, but you know, like with that being a daily practice, I'm curious if there are any other daily practices that you have found to be beneficial for you. Cause again, like 20 years in the industry and, yep. um, you know, 40, 41, 40. 41. That's damn, that's good, man. Yeah. I forget what age I am most days. You know? <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah. like you're again, like going back to what we first started with consistency and longevity and having this this long game, massive, uh, influence and ability to continue to see your kids, um, yeah. like all this stuff. Are there any other daily practices that, that you have that you would want to share? Give me just a second. Can we pause it? Yep. Literally blonde dude just rolled up. Give me a second. <laughs> All right. Am I good to just roll? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yes, great question. And I'll give you a couple, uh, a couple things that I think have helped me kind of continue to thrive. You know, it's definitely not easier because I mean, 20 years, I don't have the same energy level as when I was 20. I've definitely got more commitments. So I would say there's a couple boxes that I'm trying to check every single day. You know, I'm trying to fuel my body every single day right in an appropriate way and look that's not to say i'm perfect i don't eat clean whatever that means 100 percent <laughs> of the time i don't yeah. um friday night is pizza movie night with my kids so we have pizza yep. you know like there's a there's a balance there but i try and fuel my body so that i and that's the way i think of it right i fuel my body for optimal performance so i've got like these mantras right but i've got that uh another one is i rest and recover like an athlete so when I was doing in-home training, I was up at 4.45. I train at 6 a.m. And there are days I wouldn't get home until 7 or 8 p.m. So now I've got a little bit more control over my, my schedule. So I rest and recover like an athlete. Um, you know, the meditation piece is huge. One thing that I try and do every single day is make sure that I have dedicated time with my family every single day. So like growing up, I... I could tell you 
on we would have family dinner like as a family less than five times a year right Mm. we never sat down at the table together so my family does that every night so we always have family dinner we always have dedicated time together and then for me i always look at it as the final piece is i try and put something valuable into my brain every single day um and just being realistic here if i've you know had a super busy day that may not be sitting down and reading a hardcore anatomy or physiology textbook yeah. at 10 30 p.m you know sometimes i'm gonna read harry potter and go to bed <laughs> but if that's the case you know i'm gonna watch a couple youtube videos that i think are valuable from people i respect i'm gonna listen to a podcast i'm gonna put something good into my brain every single day and i think that is something that just puts into that that growth mindset that yeah. we all aspire to have. Um, and I'm a big believer too. I wasn't, when I was younger, I thought it just had to be technical, 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 technical. But I think again, as your worldview broadens, you can read books or you can listen to podcasts from people from totally different areas of life. And then if you've got some scope and you've got some perspective, you can take things that they're saying that apply maybe specifically to their field and then take it and apply it to ours. Yeah. So those are some of the big practices I try and check or some of the big boxes I try and check every single day. Yeah. No, I love it. Um, I love the last piece because it's, it's so true. I mean, uh, I, I, people always say like, you know, who else did you learn from? And yeah, sure. I go down the technical side and I was like, you know, like still use the R7 approach and, and yeah. everything, which is all yours. Um, and still pull a lot of pieces from assessing correct way back in the day. Right. Still yeah. applies. Yeah. Yeah. and a bulletproof athlete and just all this kind of stuff. So there's all the technical things um, and, and stuff. But I was like, yeah, really, when it comes to, you know, the the business side of things, uh, for me, it's been looking at companies like Starbucks, Disney, Nike. And so it's yes. pulling from those different aspects. And I think you're, you're spot on um, with, with all of that. And the other thing I was, I was thinking just as you're talking is first you start talking about like fueling your body, right? Yeah. I, I like to you know, consider that like, you know, uh, so many of my clients are on, you know, we're working towards losing weight um, and uh, try and make it as a byproduct of the habits, the structure, the daily practices and bringing awareness to those daily practices. And that's just a byproduct. It'll, it'll get us there. Right. Absolutely. Um, But what's interesting is with each piece, it really felt like you were saying nourish, right? Like you didn't Mm. use the word, but you're like, Yeah. yeah, fuel my body, but it's really like nourishing your body. And then it was like, you know, my mind, like, Yes. And so it was interesting. That word just like kept flooding my brain with yeah. each aspect, like with you and your kids and family. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's a fantastic word the more I think about it, right? Because, you know, we know that if you put whatever McDonald's in your body every day, like that doesn't nourish you, right? It, it provides short-term energy maybe, and it may keep you going, but it's not nourishing you. So that, I love that word. That's actually really good. And, you know, at the end of the day, for me, I just keep coming back to, it's one of my like life mantras is all in all day, every day. Hmm. And so whatever I'm doing, I want to be all in, right? So if I'm here with you, I'm all in. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not thinking about what I got to do later. All day is we have a finite amount of time here, right? And I don't know how many days I have. So I'm going to try and make the best out of every single day. And that's the everyday part, right? You know, all in all day, every day. And You know, I can't do that if I don't train consistently, if I don't fuel my body, if I don't get enough rest, if I don't meditate, like, I just know if I don't do those things, I'm a less awesome human being. (laughs) So I've got to work on that. I've got to make sure I check those boxes so that I can do all the things that I want to be able to do in life. Yeah, no, and I appreciate you saying that because it's so easy these days to buy into the the all in, but without the other aspects of it or yeah. the understanding of like, you know, team hustle, team no sleep, and then yes. it's just team, team burnout. And again, <laughs> man, right. you know, we want to do this for 20, 30, 40 years and, uh, and just thinking in terms of like, you know, the recovery aspect that you talk about. And I think that's, you know, f- recovering like an athlete is huge. So what are yes. some just tips or suggestions you give to any, anybody, but mainly gen pop when it comes to that? Cause yeah. they, they're like stressed at work, come stress themselves out at workout. And a lot of times yeah. they just leave right then and there. Yep. Yeah. This is, this is such a powerful area that I think a lot of people, not just gen pop, but athletes leave untapped too. you know, number one and put a star by it, circle it, whatever you, you need to do, but it's like sleep. 
It's the least sexy thing to talk about, but if you are not sleeping enough, you are not setting yourself up for success. Yeah. And we can look at it from a cognitive performance. We can look at it from a physical performance. We can look at it from your endocrine system. You know, I think that was one of the things for me is, you know, I got some labs back, maybe it was a year and a half, two years ago, and they were ugly. They were not good. Now, part of it, I think, was the timing of when we ran them. And they're much better now. But man, you know, and I bought this fancy aura ring to start tracking my sleep. And cool, dude, my deep sleep sucked. Like it was really bad. And that's your restorative sleep, right? Yeah. Like that's when you legitimately regenerate your body and, you know, build those hormones and all that. So number one, with a star, can't, can't work your way around it. It has got to be sleep. Now, from there, there's a lot of other stuff, and it depends on what you like to do as far as recovery. And one thing that I always try and espouse to people is that when it comes to recovery, it's a lot like training. Like, the longer you do this, you realize everything is individualized, right? So some people have to want to train like a power lifter or a bodybuilder or whatever. Like, you got to find what works for you training-wise. You got to figure out what works for you nutrition-wise paleo, keto, balanced, zone diet, like I don't care, right? But everybody's got something that works, great. The same thing with recovery. So for me personally, like this is gonna sound pretty pampered, but like for me, it's like massage. Like massage for me just works because I'm a physical person, That's probably why I'm in this industry, <laughs> right? But, and you know, uh, I've always enjoyed moving my body, playing sports, so touch, does wonders for me. I feel so much better. Um, so that's something for me that works great. Another one, if we're talking more like, I call it forced recovery, because there's no phone, no <laughs> connection to anything. But another thing that works great for me is float tanks. Nice. You know, like the deprivation tanks. Like, yeah. I love those. Like, I walk out of those and I feel super decompressed and just relaxed. Meditation kind of fits into that. I kind of sure. think of it as its own thing, but that fits into a recovery thing as well. And then I think the the final piece is things that you do before bed. Um, so I'm a big believer, not just in getting whatever your seven and a half to nine hours, but also that routine that you have before bed. So whether that's, you know, like a hot or contrast shower um, any breathing, stretching, resets that you do before bed. The way I try and describe it to my gen pop clients, especially as they get older, or even my older athletes as they age, is you got to earn your workouts. Yeah. Like, like you're not 20 anymore, right? Like legitimately in my 20s, we would have parties on Saturday night. We would shoot Jägermeister. <laughs> and then we would come in and squat heavy the next day. And we could get away with it. Now, yeah, it probably wasn't the optimal way to do things. <laughs> But we did it, right? And we survived. Sure. And if I tried to do that now, I would probably injure myself squatting the bar, warming yep. up. My body would be like, no. So that's like a way that I try and relay it to people is you got to earn your workouts. You got to earn them. So you got to sleep the requisite amount. You got to fuel your body the day before. You've got to do any breathing, stretching, resets that you deem necessary to make sure your body moves and feels the way that you want when you go into the gym. So now you start to think about, again, you talk about nourishing your body, like you got to nourish everything, right? Nutrition, the physical side, the recovery side, you got to nourish all of these things the day before, the days leading up to your workout. So now you start to think of, it's not just training to train, right? It's like you're constantly either training or setting your body up to train successfully down the line. Yeah. And it just helps you kind of understand like everything you do makes an impact, positive or negative, but everything that you do is either setting you up for success or setting you up for failure. Yeah, no, it's so beautiful. And I think it comes down to that mix between checking the box, you know, and having the commitment to do all in all every day. Yeah. Um, and, and then being strategic, you know, with that long-term plan, you know, cause so often I'll have clients that are like, you know, I'm fatigued, I'm tired and I track biometrics just because it, you know, the biofeedback cause it just gives, so many other things like, you know, where's yep. stress at, where's fatigue at, where's motivation at, yep. where's the number of sleep, you know, hours and, and stuff. And, um, and it's interesting how quickly we can be like, all right, don't go to the gym today. Literally do your <laughs> reset, do a five minute mobility flow at home. Yeah. And what do you got? Kettlebell? Sweet. Do, do a hundred kettlebell swings or, you yeah. know, whatever, whatever kind of fits within that. And it's like, 
I feel so much better. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Is so. it, isn't it crazy how your perspective on training shifts as you age, you know, cause in like your twenties, you can just battle through anything. I mean, I remember I was, I was getting ready to, to do a powerlifting meet and I kind of beat my knee up over the weekend skiing. And I went in the gym that day and somehow gutted out like a five by five squat workout. Uh, I mean, it was awful. Like the <laughs> heaviest weight I'd ever moved. My knee was swollen and I got through it. And now it's like, dude, that was so dumb. Yeah. Like, why would you ever do that? Like I could have probably, and then, right. Then that, that just caused me issues for the next two months. Right. Versus if I had just kind of taken care of myself, Hey, like go do a mobility routine and get a massage. And I probably could have been better in a week. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but my badge of honor and, you know, forcing my way through that workout and my infinite wisdom at 26, 27 years old, <laughs> probably set me back two months when yeah. it could have set me back a week. Yeah. Oh man. Powerful lessons. That, <laughs> right. uh, that, but at least we can take them going forward. Um, Absolutely. So, and that, you know, that kind of brings me, I, I definitely wanted to kind of touch on the difference between, you know, the longevity mindset of, of someone who's really playing the game for the next 15, 20 years, or even how they build that. Yeah. Um, and, and especially for kind of our comeback warriors, right? We have, you know, so many people in gen pop that they played sports in high school, college, you know, were a part of a team and then, you know, went on to do career life kids. And now it's like for the sure. comeback and, it's so hard because they haven't slowly been through a progression of, of things athletically, right? Every yes. other area of life developed and changed and adapted, but it's still this, like, this is how I trained, you know, in high yes. school and yes. boom, I'm back in, but now I'm weekend warrior stressed out, limited time, limited sleep, right. you know, tips for right. that mindset to, to help people pull back more than anything else, you know, when stepping back in. Yeah. And, so I think the first thing is to just recognize, like, like be really honest with yourself. And this is hard, but just say, hey, look, like, it, it took me a while to get to this point, right? So I can't immediately jump back in and do exactly what I was doing. It's not to say you can never do it. And so one thing that I always kind of try and preface my training programs with when I'm asking myself questions is, what are the tissues prepared to do? Right. So the last thing you want is that weekend warrior that was a stud athlete in high school, college, them to come in and they haven't trained in eight years or whatever. Right. And they're 50 yeah. pounds overweight and they think oh, I'm going to start with box jump. Like, no, because the worst thing that you could have them do is they blow their Achilles on day one. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like, hey, look, I will always feed them that that thought process of, look, I know exactly where you want to be because I've been there, too right? Like I didn't play sports in college. Like I didn't play like on a scholarship or something, but I played every intramural sport known to man until I was like 24 years old. So I know that mindset and I love that. But we also have to recognize you haven't done a lot of those things. So we can get you there, but we've got to follow a process. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the way I always try and explain it to them. It's like, we can do all of the things it's CrossFit, right? Like people <laughs> like CrossFit still somewhat polarizing, but it's like, we can do all the things. We can be fast and strong and explosive and well-conditioned, but we can't do them all at once. Right. Right. We can bring you to a point where we've got all of those physical qualities, but we can't train all of them at once. Yeah. So it's got to be a systematic approach. You're 50 pounds overweight. Look, here's what we got to do. We've got to build your tissues. And I probably wouldn't use that word with people, but sure. like, we just got to, we got to build you a base, right? We got to build a base. We've got to dial in your nutrition. We've got to get that, 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 and Maybe not all at once, but we've got to build you up to where that in five, six months, we can absolutely do all the things that you want to do. And I think if you're talking to a rational human, most of them <laughs> can get behind that. You know, you're yeah. always going to have that one guy or gal. It's like, no, I'm doing it all right now. And, you know, maybe you can tamp that enthusiasm down and get them to what you want to do. And, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we're not for everybody, yeah. right? Because <laughs> there is Joe Blow down the road that's willing to let them blow their Achilles uh, doing a box jump on day one. But yeah, you know, that's, that's how I try and approach it is like, look, I love your vision. Like, I love that. I want to get you there, but let's kind of check some boxes along the way to make sure we do it in a healthy, sustainable way. That's going to allow you to be awesome and keep up with your kids and even your grandkids, you know, when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 
And so I think sometimes if you come at it with that approach and that mindset, yeah, people can be pretty darn responsive. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, you're coming in with a support them, uh, paint the vision with them instead yes. of you know letting them just have whatever small section of the vision they have and kind of expanding and broadening it. Absolutely. Um, what's cool for me is, as I was listening to that, <clears throat> you know, so uh, one of the other things I've got going on right now, I'm coaching a strength and conditioning coach for uh, a local high school's basketball team. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, so we're doing 12 weeks during their, which is amazing, get full 12 weeks during yeah, their it's huge. Uh, their preseason and then we'll go to one possibly two in season um yeah. and then we'll do some postseason stuff which is which is amazing and uh and so these these kids uh 15 16 17 18 years old have never had a strength and conditioning coach at their school and it's something they're trying to like really elevate their program right and uh and, and so i get this opportunity to educate more than anything else right and yes. And it's interesting because they're like, well, what about, what about box squats? And, and are we supposed to be doing it? I'm like, no, like this is the beginning. I'm like, this is called an accumulation phase. Let me walk you through <laughs> why we're doing what we're doing right. and where it will get us and what we'll be able to do. And like already painting that picture. And yes. so it's interesting because I'm thinking, man, a lot of my, you know, quote unquote athletes, my adult pop that I've coached that are in their forties, fifties, who are that, that warrior that, uh, um, that we were talking about, they, didn't have that level of experience back in the day. Cause before man, you know, 20, 40 years ago, anywhere in that <laughs> time frame, you know, especially like in the world of football or something, it was like, you know, go grab a bar. We're power cleaning. We're going to hit, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> we're hitting singles today. Like, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no. And, and it's crazy to think about how much it's evolved. Right. And I think part of the reason those dudes didn't break down as much is because their physical base was so much better right? Their movement literacy was so much better. They spent so much more time outdoors and doing things. And now it's like, we just railroad kids into, you're going to play one sport. Yeah. And then as soon as you can, we're going to put you in the weight room and then we're going to make you bigger and faster and stronger with no conception of the fact that, well, maybe this kid doesn't move great or they've only played one sport. They've got poor movement literacy. Like there's so many reasons we shouldn't be doing that stuff early on versus like you said, hey, we're going to start with an accumulation block. I'm going to actually teach you how to squat the right way. Maybe we're going to use a kettlebell or yeah. even a five-pound plate to teach you how to do that. Like, it's so foreign to so many people still. It's crazy. But I think, quite frankly, that's why, you know, we saw so many fewer in- massive injuries. Like, when we yeah. we're talking, like, you know, back injuries and ACLs, those people just had a flat-out better movement base. And yeah. so if we as coaches can't work to kind of thrust ourselves into that conversation and start to cultivate that in the weight room or in our training sessions, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to fix this injury issue that we have for a long time. Yeah. No, and, and you're making me laugh because like, you know, we were doing basically dead bugs, pushups with, with a solid reach and, yeah. uh, and some lever squats for that first two weeks. And like some of these kids were smashed, like, and it was really yeah. hard and you know, yeah. they want to go deadlift PRs. And, and absolutely, so, uh, absolutely. Cool. But the crazy thing is like, you get them to do that stuff for 12 weeks and I guarantee they're going to jump better. They're yeah. going to jump better. They're going to be in a better defensive stance. They're going to be quicker moving side to side. I mean, I've seen it with like guys that are in the pros. We had a guy last year, he could touch like 11, one, 11, one and a half. He was like my height. So this dude could jump. Yeah. But every time he jumped, he's like both knees, both hips hurt. So I had this dude for like eight, 10 weeks and he never squatted anything over a 16 kilo kettlebell. That was it, right? Cause he was just awfully aligned. He didn't absorb force well. And so we did basic stuff. And you know what? He put like two and a half inches on his vert. Yeah. He's like, not only did my vert go up, but I don't hurt anymore. So love it. Love it. like that dude's bought in, you know? So anyway, soapbox, I'll try and step off. Now. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's so good. It's so good. Cause it's, it's relatable. And you know, it's like for people that, that are listening, it's figure out what you actually need, what's actually yes. going to make you better. And you can almost lose sight of the outcome itself and it will come, right? Like his Absolutely. goal is to jump higher, but really it's pulling back and it's jump without pain. Yes. And, uh, and so it's getting into the stuff that's going to do that and just doing that consistency. You know, consistency. For sure. For sure. So, cool, man. Well, before I ask my last question, um, where can, can people find you um, kind of across the boards and, and what do you got going on these days for either coaches or, or Gen Pop that may be listening? Yeah. 
So the best place is to find out what I got going on if you just want free stuff, robertsontrainingsystems.com. Uh, been around since 05, 06 at this point. So fair amount of content there yeah. <laughs> between <laughs> articles, podcasts, videos. There's plenty of stuff there to keep you entertained. Uh, if you're a coach or a trainer and you're looking to really level up, if you want to get some insight into our coaching system, I would go to completecoachcertification.com. That's where uh, we will be launching. We've already done it once, but we'll be launching our certification again in March of 2020. And I mean, that's, that's where you need to start. Like if you want to learn everything Mike Robertson from programming to coaching to queuing to interacting with clients and athletes, that's where I would go because that's going to give you a great foundation to build from going forward. Cool. Yeah. And I can't speak highly enough about, uh, about any of the, the things for coaches that you've offered. I mean, I was, I think it was one of the, in the first round of, uh, kind of a, a coaching mentorship that, that you yeah. did teaching your system. Yeah. Um, it reshaped the way that I ran all my semi-private and, and stuff like that. And it was, it was gold. And I taught that to multiple coaches and I know some of the biggest gyms in the, the country use that same R7 approach and everything. So, yeah, thanks man. I appreciate it. It's, we're passionate, you know, like Bill, yeah. myself, anybody that comes through IFAST, like we're just passionate about helping other trainers and coaches get the most out of their clients and athletes. So I really appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah. And then the other piece I just, I had to, I was thinking about it as you were, as you're talking. Um, but yeah, your blog, I mean, yours and like Cressy's and, and a few others, right. Uh, yeah. Smitty, you know, like that's what I used to read before there was all of this other kind of stuff, stuff. Instagram yeah. and, and uh, podcasts for sure weren't, weren't a thing and everything. So, um, and then Dude, yeah, those were great you, days. Those were great days, man. There was so much good information out there and granted it's a little bit dated now, but people were just so willing to share and share freely at that point in time. It was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tony gentle course, I, man, I still yeah. crack up at his stuff. <laughs> yeah. He's a funny guy, man. He, he always finds a way to make things entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I know you still do some blogging. I mean, like you were talking about movement literacy and you did an awesome article on don't use movement quality, right. Or what yes. is it like do, yes. use it within context. And so I know I'm going on another tangent type thing, but for coaches listening, go seek that out. I think that was really powerful. It's something I hadn't thought about. And so it yes. just brought another level of awareness to something that I was like, man, I can shift this. I can adapt and improve upon this. Um, so that's sort of that growth mindset of, man, stay humble, keep growing. Yeah, no, I, I was really excited to write that because I've been a little bit lax in my writing these days, but yeah, it was just something where that term movement quality just gets thrown around and like, like at the end of the day, does anybody want their client or their athlete to move poorly? No. <laughs> so it's like, why, why even use that term? Of course we want our clients to move well. Okay. But what does that actually mean? And starting to have some of those deeper discussions. And I think that's where we really start to push our industry forward. It's like, okay, well, you and I, right, may have a totally different concept of how we want to teach a squat to a gen pop client or to one of our basketball players versus how a power lifter is going to coach a squat to break a world record. Right. So <laughs> neither one of us is wrong, right? Like we're just looking at things through a different lens. And so again, peeling back the, the layers of these discussions, I think is where we can really push our industry forward in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, no, and I think that's good because I mean, and I think that's why I want coaches to hear this and one of the reasons I wanted to do this one, but keep it a little bit more like fire off the cuff and instead of <laughs> going just in the trenches on, on training yeah. and stuff, um, because you are the one or one of the few that changes perspective on language. Um, I mean, one of our first conversations was posture versus position and you're like, yes. does posture matter? And I'm like, yeah, right. like it's everything. And you're like, can you get in the right position, even if you have what we would quote unquote call poor posture? And I was like, yep. whoa, mind blown, thinking differently. <laughs> right. <laughs> you right. know? And I so know. that's the stuff that's going to shift and, and propel our industry forward. So thanks for starting those conversations for sure. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. Sweet. So last, last question, and it's one that I ask every guest um, and shows called Truth of Transformation. It's really, you know, understanding what it takes to transform. And we've talked a lot about longevity, consistency, creating space and creating balance and harmony and meditation and stuff. So, yep. uh, you know, you could pull from so many different things and I'd say they're probably all right, but I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what you feel it takes to truly transform. So... 
this is a tough one, but I'm going to say you've heard the saying before that everything happens twice, right? Once in the mind and once in reality. Yeah. And, and I really feel like you've got to get your mind right before anything and before anything truly transformative happens in your life, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's transforming your body, transforming your career, transforming your relationships. You have to buy into this idea that your mind has to be all into that, right? Like the mind drives everything else. And if you don't believe it, if you don't buy into it, it's not going to happen, right? We've all met those people that have the best of intentions and you can just tell they're just not bought in. They're just not going to see the result. And it's, it's sad because I've seen this a, a few times close up, you know, a couple of times with specific clients that just stand out in my brain. And I feel like, you know, I, when I was younger, I blamed myself. I felt like I had failed them. And, and with time I realized, man, I put in everything I could to that client. Like they failed themselves. And I've seen it with coaches too, where, you know, certain people I've interacted and been around over the years, like, you know, they're just constantly looking for the next thing. Well, I'm not happy here. I'm going to go, I'll be happy when I get this job. And yeah. they get that job and they're still not happy. Like, no, no, like you, and I've tried to have the discussion and it's, you, you can tell if they're not ready to have that discussion. It's like, look, the problem isn't the position. It's not how much money you make. The problem is you. And until you get comfortable and if you get the right mindset about, you know, your career or your life or what's going to make you happy, like, it doesn't matter. You're not, you're not going to truly transform. You're not going to get to where you want to be. So I think, you know, the mindset piece is just so critical. It's something that you can't, you can't fake. You can't motivate your way around. Like you have to get your brain moving in the right direction. And again, for me, for a lot of us, I think it's those four things. You keep coming back to training, nutrition, recovery, and then the mindset, you know, and the meditation and that sort of thing. If you can kind of lock those four things in, those are like dominoes that knock over a lot more dominoes, right? Take care of you, get your mindset going in the right direction. And then I think you can truly transform, but it's going to be really tough. if You don't get your mind kind of on board with where you're going. The uh, wisdom chronicles of Michael. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. My, no, my, my weekend guru certification course will be up next yeah, week. You know? Yeah. Philosophy point zero one one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, so good, man. I appreciate that. That's my uh, pleasure. So thank you for coming on the show. We'll definitely link up all the stuff that uh, you mentioned in the show notes for sure. And um, definitely a good follow for anyone who's listening um, YouTube. And, and like I said, I pull so many, so many of his queuing videos for, for current <laughs> clients and stuff. So definitely uh, follow if you're in anything fitness or nutrition and you want to just get better. So Mike, greatly appreciate it, brother. I love it, man. Thanks so much for having me on, brother. All right, my friends. Thanks again for listening to another great episode. Now, I do have one request. If you know of someone that's got an amazing success story, or if you know of a transformational coach or transformation authority figure with insights and lessons that need to be shared, we'd love to talk to any of these people. There's a good chance we can have them on one of the next episodes, and they continue to help us all grow as we continue to unveil the truth of what it takes to truly transform. Last thing love for you to head on over to iTunes and hit that five-star review button. Helps to get this message out and continue to transform more lives. As always, my friends, Coach Joseph Hawthorne, peace be the journey.